Hello everyone, and welcome back to our channel. Today, we're diving deep into a topic that affects millions of people worldwide, that is kidney stones, also known as nephrolithiasis. Have you ever wondered where the term kidney stones comes from? To understand, we must travel back in time to ancient Greece. The Greeks had a word, nephros, which means kidney, and another word, lithos, which translates to stone. Combine them, and you get nephrolithiasis, the medical term for kidney stones. Now, sometimes, these stones don't stay put. When a stone finds its way to the ureter, the tube connecting the kidney and the bladder, we refer to it as ureterolithiasis. And if it ends up in the bladder? That's called systolithiasis. These terms may sound complicated, but when broken down, they simply pinpoint the location of the stone in our urinary system. Understanding kidney stones begins with the basics of kidney anatomy. Positioned retroperitoneally beside the spine below the ribcage, our kidneys are fist-sized, bean-shaped organs. They draw oxygenated blood from the renal artery, process it, and return it via the renal vein. Observing a kidney cross-section, we discern three regions, the cortex, medulla, and pelvis. The cortex, outermost, houses nephrons which start blood filtration and urine formation. The medulla contains renal pyramids to further refine the filtrate and concentrate urine. The pelvis, innermost, gathers urine from nephrons and funnels it to the ureter, leading to the bladder for excretion. Now, let's talk about kidney stone formation. The pathophysiology behind this process is quite fascinating. Step 1 is supersaturation. Our urine contains various substances, such as calcium, oxalate, and uric acid. When the concentration of these substances in the urine becomes too high, it exceeds the ability of the urine to dissolve them. Step 2 is nucleation. In supersaturated urine, tiny crystals can start to form. These crystals are the building blocks of kidney stones. The type of crystals that form depends on the composition of your urine. Step 3 is crystal growth. Once these crystals form, they can grow larger over time, creating the foundation of a kidney stone. Step 4 is aggregation. As these crystals continue to grow, they may start sticking together. This aggregation process can result in the formation of a larger, solid stone. Finally, step 5 is stone migration. Once a kidney stone reaches a certain size, it may break free from the kidney and start to move down the ureter. The real pain often starts when the stone gets stuck in the narrow ureter. Let's explore the five main types of kidney stones in detail. The most common type of kidney stone is calcium oxalate stones. These stones form when there is an excess of calcium and oxalate in the urine. Oxalate is a naturally occurring substance found in many foods, including leafy greens, nuts, and chocolate. This type accounts for about 80% of all kidney stones. Next, we have calcium phosphate stones. These stones are also related to high levels of calcium in the urine, but instead of oxalate, they combine with phosphate. Certain conditions such as hyperparathyroidism, renal tubular acidosis, and even some medications can contribute to their formation. Moving on, we have uric acid stones. These stones form due to elevated levels of uric acid in the urine. Uric acid is a waste product created when the body breaks down purines, which are found in certain foods and drinks, such as red meat and alcohol. These stones can be associated with a diet high in purines, certain medical conditions like gout, or a family history of uric acid stone formation. Struvite stones, also known as infection stones, develop when there is a urinary tract infection caused by specific bacteria, usually ureas producing bacteria like proteus. Klebsiella, or Pseudomonas. These bacteria can raise the urine pH and promote the formation of struvite crystals. These stones can grow rapidly and often become quite large to occupy a large portion of the renal pelvis and calyces causing staghorn calculi. Lastly, we have cysteine stones. These stones are quite rare, accounting for only about 1% of all kidney stones. They are hereditary and result from a genetic condition known as cystinuria. In this condition, the kidneys excrete too much cysteine, an amino acid, into the urine. Over time, the excess cysteine can accumulate and crystallize, eventually leading to stone formation. 
Kidney stones can affect anyone, but they tend to have a few key risk factors associated with their development. Let's explore these factors in detail. Family history can be a significant determinant. If someone in your family has had kidney stones, it may imply a genetic predisposition that elevates your risk. Dehydration is a critical factor to consider as well. Insufficient water intake leads to concentrated urine, which can facilitate the crystallization of minerals and salts into stones. Dietary choices matter, particularly the consumption of foods rich in oxalates and sodium, which can heighten your risk. Obesity also plays a role due to metabolic changes and insulin resistance. Underlying medical conditions, such as urinary tract infections, gout, and inflammatory bowel disease, can contribute to stone formation. Medications like diuretics and calcium antacids are known culprits. Age, gender, geography, and a history of previous kidney stones all factor into your risk profile. Now, let's explore the signs and symptoms of kidney stones. The hallmark symptom of kidney stones is intense, severe flank pain. This pain, often described as one of the most excruciating experiences, usually originates in the back or side, below the ribcage. The pain can come in waves and may radiate down to the lower abdomen and groin. Another common symptom is hematuria. Kidney stones can irritate the urinary tract leading to increased frequency of urination too. Painful urination can also occur, with a burning sensation when passing urine. Some individuals with kidney stones may experience nausea and vomiting. In some cases, a kidney stone that causes an infection or blocks urine flow can lead to fever and chills. Kidney stones can sometimes be entirely asymptomatic if the stone is small, located in a less sensitive area, or simply not causing any blockage or irritation. Diagnosing kidney stones is crucial for effective treatment. Initially, a detailed medical history is taken, including previous kidney stones, family history, and symptoms. A physical examination is done to check for tenderness in the abdomen and back. A urine dipstick quickly detects blood and infection markers like leukocytes and nitrites. This is followed by urinalysis, examining cells and crystals. Blood tests including a comprehensive metabolic panel are done to identify infections, assess kidney function and type of stone. Now, let's discuss imaging techniques essential for diagnosing kidney stones. A simple abdominal x-ray can detect many kidney stones, especially those composed of calcium. However, not all stones are visible on x-rays. Ultrasound is another useful tool. It's non-invasive and safe, making it an excellent option for pregnant patients or those concerned about radiation exposure. Ultrasound can detect some stones that x-rays might miss. The gold standard for kidney stone diagnosis is a CTKUB. It provides detailed images of the kidneys and urinary tract, helping identify the size, location, and composition of the stones. In some cases, a urogram may be recommended. This involves injecting a contrast dye and taking x-ray images as the dye travels through the urinary tract. It helps visualize stones and any blockages more clearly. Finally, after removing a kidney stone, it's essential to analyze the stone composition to determine the type of stone, which can guide treatment. It's essential to rule out other conditions such as urinary tract infections, appendicitis, or ovarian cysts, which can have similar symptoms. The size of a kidney stone plays a crucial role in determining the most appropriate management strategy. Small kidney stones, usually less than 5 mm in size, have a good chance of passing on their own without medical intervention. Conservative management is typically the initial approach for these stones. Staying well hydrated is essential to help flush out smaller stones and prevent the formation of new ones. Over-the-counter pain medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or acetaminophen can provide relief from pain. In some cases, your healthcare provider may prescribe tamsulosin. Tamsulosin is an alpha blocker that helps relax the muscles in your ureter, making it easier for stones to pass. When conservative measures aren't sufficient or for larger stones, active interventions may be necessary. Extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy involves the use of shock waves to break up kidney stones into smaller fragments that can be passed through the urinary tract. 
This method is suitable for stones in the kidney or upper ureter. For larger stones that cannot be treated with shock wave, more invasive approaches may be required. Ureteroscopy entails inserting a thin, flexible scope through the urethra to visualize and remove stones in the ureter or lower pole of the kidney. Stones can also be fragmented during this procedure using laser or other energy sources. Percutaneous nephrolithotomy is a surgical procedure used for larger kidney stones or when other methods are ineffective. It involves making a small incision in the back, allowing instruments to be inserted directly into the kidney to remove or break up the stone. Open surgery is rarely performed today, and it's typically reserved for very large or complicated stones when other methods aren't feasible. Kidney stones can lead to infections like pyelonephritis. If so, appropriate antibiotics are prescribed based on the bacteria's sensitivity. In cases where an infected urinary system is obstructed, emergent drainage may be necessary. This is typically achieved through the placement of a nephrostomy tube or ureteral stent to relieve the obstruction and prevent further complications. To minimize kidney stone risks, ensure a fluid intake producing at least 2 liters of urine daily. Dietary adjustments like reduced sodium and animal protein, increased citrate-rich foods, and moderated oxalate intake might be suggested based on stone composition. Some may need medications for particular metabolic issues causing stone formation, such as thiazide diuretics for hypercalciuria, potassium citrate for hypocitraturia or allopurinol for hyperuricuria. A 24-hour urine analysis can pinpoint metabolic irregularities, guiding diet or medication adjustments. Kidney stones can lead to various complications, including urinary tract obstruction, hydronephrosis, and urinary tract infections. They may also cause hematuria. In severe cases, kidney stones can result in abscess formation, kidney function impairment, and long-term issues like ureteral strictures, which narrow the ureter and affect urine flow. And there you have it a comprehensive guide to understanding kidney stones. Thanks for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe for more enlightening content.